Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for the virtual educational series, India's Reach webinar series. Uh, we're discussing aerospace defence and security market trends and opportunities for Australia and the ASEAN region. Thank you very much for joining us once again on episode four. And uh, we do have some special guests and I'd like to welcome my co-host there in Delhi, Mr. Raman Sapuri. Raman, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you, Chris. Uh, for the audience joining us for the first time, my name is Chris Cabbage. I'm the executive editor and director for My Security Media. And this is a partner series with the Aerospace and Defence Consultants Association of India. Uh, our friend uh, Raman there in Delhi and uh, My Security Media and the My Security Marketplace. We, on this particular episode, episode four, will be joined by the Australian Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology, Dr. Tobias Beacon. We have a slight technical issue that we're sorting out now, uh, but we will be joined uh, on the line by, uh, by Dr. Beacon as a minimum. And uh, very, very privileged to have uh, Air Vice Marshal Sinha, uh, VSM, retired the advisor for BL and CRL in Bangalore. Did I answer you in Delhi, uh, ABM Sinha, or Bangalore? Yeah. Bangalore. Bangalore. Well, wonderful to have you on the line here, there in ba Bangalore. Uh, we have a cross with Sydney, Delhi, Bangalore, and, uh, and in Canberra. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, just as we start this episode, and uh, I'm going to be slightly um, uh, distracted as we bring on, on the ambassador and, and get him on the line, as a minimum, as an audio uh, at least, what I'll do is I'll at least uh, do a brief introduction um, and then I'll have Raman introduce uh, ABM Sinha uh, and then uh, ABM Sinha will give a warm welcome to the ambassador uh, and then we'll hear from the ambassador. This particular series uh, we'll wrap around the ambassador's role, particularly on cybersecurity, critical technology, and Australia's international cyber security engagement strategy, uh, and then obviously the links to India there. Um, as we normally do, uh, there you go, there's uh, Dr. Dr. Thiekin, if we don't get to see him uh, shortly. There's just a slight delay with the slides. Just some news as we normally cover off uh, as we move forward. Uh, a recent speech, and this is uh, courtesy of Rahman, um, the director of the, of the FBI gave a speech uh, about a week or so ago and now, just in terms of uh, the American perception of the threat posed by China. Uh, and again, this is something else that we're covering in terms of the defense aspect. Um, and as we move through, so that was uh, the Hudson Institute speech uh, that is available, and that speech is delivered, uh, remarks as delivered. Uh, some recent news out of India and what the Indian news is covering. Um, India plans to invite Australia to join the annual Malabar Naval Exercise. Uh, I think this is the first time, uh, obviously, for the Quad to meet Japan, US, Australia, um, and India. Uh, so interesting developments there. And some, there's some other essay articles written around that. So definitely perceived as a, um, as a significant move. Uh, and then also continuing on, uh, Google is to invest $10 billion uh, in terms of the Infotech plan. Uh, and that is a significant investment uh, at that level uh, from Google. So we're continuing to see that shift over to India uh, in a way. Uh, we are very pleased to release the latest edition of Cyber Risk Leaders magazine on Friday. There's about 16 uh, key articles uh, on there. It's free uh, on the My Security Marketplace. Um, it's something I think we're about 85 editions of our digital magazines now uh, and we have a cyber and COVID theme. Uh, very interesting articles and this is from an India colleague uh, on the submarine cable network and the global sovereign assets being basically uh, laid out uh, around the world and uh, some recent cable uh, supplies there. So it's an interesting reading and otherwise it's available on issue.com. Uh, just out Yesterday was the Australia's Digital Trust Report 2020 out of OSCyber, and we will be hearing from uh, OSCyber next week, episode five. Um, and this is a, it's an interesting read. I haven't gone through in absolute detail just yet, but basically the digital economy and what that would mean if it's significantly disrupted. 
particularly from a major critical infrastructure attack if, if the networks are taken down and the impacts. But for our India colleagues, it provides a benchmark of what the Australian economy and digital economy is sized at uh, in our tour. And it does follow on last week from last week, Raman, uh, in terms of our discussions with Optus Macquarie and, and the trust, the research around the trust aspects of cyber uh, and some of the uh, aspects of cyber here is, is recognised in, in much the same way. So uh, well worth reading again, available on uh, the My Security Marketplace. Uh, and as we move to introduce the ambassador, uh, I'm not going to leave this up for too long, but we cover all aspects of technology, aerospace, defence uh, and security. And it tends to be uh, pinned over at the top by cybersecurity uh, increasingly. So with that in view, uh, Raman, I'm going to hand over to you. If you can please introduce uh, Air Vice Marshal uh, Sinha, uh, VSM retired, and uh, give a bit about his background. And we'll try and while I'm doing while you're doing that, I'm going to try and get the ambassador on the line at least. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce our panelists, Air Vice Marshal P.K. Sinha, retired Vishist Seva Medal from the Indian Air Force. Air Marshal Sinha has been a distinguished career in the Indian Air Force, both in the aircraft and non-aircraft business. One of the prestigious assignment which gave to him was commanding the Software Development Institute at Bangalore. SDI, for the sake of those who do not know, is a premium organization integrating software for the entire Air Force platforms. This particular organization reports directly to Air Force headquarters. Whatever platforms are flying in India, the software integration happens at SDI Bangalore. And SDI Bangalore is the nodal agency both for Hindustan Aeronautics and the uh, OEM and Tier 1s from the rest of the world. So, AVM Sina is currently in Bangalore and is advisor to Bharat Electronics uh, Central Research Laboratory. And it's a pleasure to welcome you, sir. And uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. So, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> and thank you, Raman sir. Good morning, viewers. Uh, shall I say good morning or good afternoon or good evening? It's everything. But welcome, uh, uh, viewers, to this webinar. Uh, Chris. <clears throat> You have uh, shown the slides, and uh, it's uh, really uh, unprecedented times. Post, uh, uh, in fact, we are amidst the COVID-19 infection. Uh, invisible virus has made us realize that we have to coexist with all the abnormalities in this world. The new world is, order is changing. Uh, everything is changing. Our behavioral pattern has to go under go a change, and not only that, we have been forced to work from home, and social distancing is now a norm. And that's why we are from different city. We are merging on one platform through internet and site. And because of over dependency of internet, sir, we are now facing another new dimension, which is the cyber security, it has become very critical because as uh, you all have seen initial uh, <clears throat> in this changing order, some country is taking as a uh, opportunity to threaten some countries with the, their cyber uh, war, you can say, cyber terrorism, you can say, cyber crime, you can say, but yes, the info war is on. And we have to today uh, take into cognizance the cyber security. And this is a, a need of the hour and very uh, a good uh, opportunity and very good uh, webinar, which you all have been uh, doing it that is cyber security and critical technology. And I think that now it is the time that countries, which are uh, uh, democratic countries, especially Australia and India, should join hand and should uh, uh, march ahead forward and give impetus to this critical technology. Uh, I have honor to welcome uh, today the uh, main guest speaker, Dr. Tobias Pekin. Uh, he's Australia's inaugural ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology. 
He leads Australia's goal of government international engagement to advance and protect Australia's national security, foreign policy, economic and trade, and development in the internet and cyberspace. He was the director of national security program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute from 2012 to 2016, and has established the Institute's International Cyber Policy Center. Nobody better would have been here today, the guest. He has also held a number of research and advisory positions, including with the Royal United Service Institute for Defense and Security Studies, the Oxford University Global Cyber Security Capacity Center, the Global Commission on Internet Governance, and the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Ambassador Fakin holds an honors degree in security studies and a doctorate of philosophy in international politics and security studies, both from the University of Bradford. Over to you, Ambassador. Um, good to be with you again, albeit only via audio. Um, in incredibly important to be with you um, in light of and uh, in light of the fact that our, our countries are just so ever closer together, India and Australia. Uh, my own personal, um, I have a very close tie to India, was that I was a very young PhD student who arrived in Delhi um, 20 years ago now. I mean, it, God, it flies, doesn't it, time when you're having fun, um, and, and did a lot of PhD fieldwork in India with the paramilitary forces there. So I have long ties with India, a strong affection, an affinity uh, with India and his people. So it really gratifies me a great deal to be able to bring some of those close connections to bear in a government role. Um, so so thank you very much for everyone who's who's listening and who, who are there right now. And um, please thank you for the previous speaker and Vice Marshal um, for, for everything that you've said. Um, I certainly caught a bit about partnerships there and certainly partnerships we always feel is incredibly vital to anything you do in the tech space. Um, collaboration is vital and I think that's certainly where um, we, we want to see the um, India-Australia relationship keep, keep developing uh, towards is closer collaboration and especially on technology issues. Um, it's no secret that India is, is, is a hub of uh, technology innovation um, and foresight and um, you know we're, we're very excited to be working with India on a whole range of issues. But maybe if I just take a quick step backwards, um, just explain to anyone out there who, and probably everyone, <laughs> I shouldn't assume any anyone really knows what this position is, um, but as the ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology, I was, um, the, the position itself was first established back in 2016 as part of our cybersecurity strategy. And the intention was to um, create a senior, a coordination role within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, to bring together all of the different elements of the Australian government proposition in cyber affairs. And by cyber affairs, I mean um, all of our national interest in cyberspace, whether it be economic interest, national security, um, human rights, d uh, digital development, whole, all of our interests in that environment. Um, and also engage with industry, academia, try and bring that multi-stakeholderism to life and then take that proposition out into the international arena and, and, and shape that. Um, so in that role, I've, I've had the privilege of holding the position for three years and I think what, what could I say changed most considerably during that time? Well, if, if the position when it first started was a reflection of um, the changing strategic prominence of cyber issues in, um, in, in government affairs and at the very senior levels of government affairs, um, then where we found ourselves now, um, and certainly in India's case, very evident um, in daily news reporting, is how technology has become central to geo the geopolitical landscape and, and not just cyber related issues, but you know this, this area of what we're terming critical technologies, some would say emerging technologies, but if you like the new tech horizon, which is undoubtedly shaping the 21st century, its economy, its security um, and societal uh, shaping, um, you know, it's become evident that it's, it's inescapable having to address these issues um, from a government perspective and trying to do so in a way that's enabling rather than um, 
uh, uh, if you like, acting as a choke point to innovation and, and development in these areas, because there's no doubting when we look out over the technology horizon that um, it's, it's an incredibly exciting place to be and to um, understand what it will enable. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we're already many people on the call will be already enjoying the fruits of, of the new technology space and even just the pure connectivity that cyberspace enables. Um, but we're seeing that accelerate at an enormous rate of knots and that governments now cannot shy away from thinking about strategic policy in this area as well. And that's certainly where we find ourselves in Australia um, and uh, something that we're working hard on at the moment is trying to present uh, an international engagement strategy for Australia on cyber and critical technology. Um, and at its purest sense, it's examining, well, what is it that Australia wants out of the technology environment? Um, what is it that we can shape? Um, what would we like to shape? Um, and what are our core interests? And, and to be frank, it, it, it really uh, uh, gravitates around three core areas of interest which wouldn't surprise anyone one of which is well how do we make the most from an economic perspective um in the new technology environment that we're uh, venturing into um how do we ensure that our national security interests are maintained and progressed in that environment and then thirdly uh what kind of values and principles um do we want to represent in that tech environment um and you know well, why do we do that? Because we see that technologies are being developed at a, at a rate of knots, and with different principles and values uh, being, if you like, baked in at early stages. Um, and I think you know we as governments have to begin to really play into that that environment and and make clear what it is we would like to see from technology. You know, there's going to be some profound shaping of societies off the back of whether it be AI, quantum computing, blockchain, and a whole raft of other, you know, new emerging, especially digital technologies, um, that that we we need to help shape what those are going to look like, um, and we can maybe dig into some of that in the Q and A. Um, so we're we're developing that strategy right now, um, and and uh, uh, the foreign minister will be launching that at some point uh, over the course of the coming months. Um, um, and we think that's fundamentally important and nowhere more so than in our relationship with India, uh, where, you know, it, it's quite evident the fact that our leadership signed a comprehensive strategic partnership upgraded, at least in a, you know, from a government to government perspective, what the relationship is and means um, and bringing some additional um, heft to that strategic partnership was a new agreement on cyber and critical technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's so that we can collaborate more closely on these issues, so we can look at how R&D might work together, um, can look at jointly how we can assist others in understanding this new tech landscape um, and, um, you know, putting money where our mouths are that we invested um, uh, just around uh, uh, $12.7 million in, in that partnership um, to ensure that there's uh, some some cash to uh, assist in that, that uh, maturing of the relationship. Um, so it's something that you know both our governments are really excited about. Um, I know my minister is incredibly excited about w how we take that forward. Um, but I think you know it's, it's these kinds of relationships are very very important um, as we see the evolution of the tech landscape. Um, you know we we. Uh, the tech environment is a is a strange, fast-moving beast, um, and if we can make these partnerships agile and um, adaptable um, to what we see out there in the tech environment, well, then you know it, it will benefit all our peoples. Um, so I think you know with that, I'm happy to take a few questions, Chris, and see how you'd like to play it. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all, and and you know as ever, really really excited to work closer with India. Thank you very much, Dr. Fagan. Uh, and we'll take, uh, go for it, uh, ABM Sinha. Thank you. Uh, Chris, if I can honor uh, to uh, ask a question to Dr. Fagan. Sir, you have done a lot of strategies, uh, policy uh, uh, initiative you have taken in your country. 
uh, any uh, policy you have uh, on social media strategies, social media strategy, because this is coming in a big way and uh, it is impacting the national security and the country. Mm. Um, I, I mean, there's a whole raft of approaches that we have to domestic approaches to, I, I presume you mean the, the misuse of social media rather than social media as a, as a, as a medium. Um, but, but a good question and a pertinent one there, Vice Marshal. Um, it, it's 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 um, something again that's reverberating in our in our news uh, feeds on a on a minute by minute basis. Um, the, one of the ways that we've certainly been looking at it through an international lens is um, examining uh, during COVID nineteen. Uh, looking at more of the disinformation, misinformation piece. Um, and it goes without saying that, you know, in a time when the clarity and precision of information is everything for the public and how they should behave and act and, um, you know, create a safer environment for them and their families, having accurate information out is, is vital. Um, so, you know, for us, the fact that there are clearly um, actors out there, wherever their origins might be, who are looking to misinform and disinform individuals um, is not acceptable. Um, and in, in the international sense, we've certainly shared information with partners. We have made, um, uh, um, we, we, we've uh, signed agreements, uh, the UN, uh, uh, statements rather, on, on the, the uh, perspective of you know how abhorrent this is in in the current environment um so we've done our piece on the international um setting um, and certainly domestically our uh relative responsible agencies um through our home affairs department and others um including um a function that we have here called the safety commissioner who does incredibly useful and uh, potent work on working on good information um, through social media channels and uh, you know holding poor information to account we do have various mechanisms um, to to um, uh, approach the private sector firms who are running these uh, social who, who, who own the platforms um, but you know we we haven't decided to legislate our way out of this I think that's you know what's important we do have some legislation but we haven't decided to take a heavy-handed approach um, because you you know we do appreciate that we you know you get into that very gray space of freedom of speech of um, you know freedom of expression um, and you know that that's a question that should rightfully create um, challenges for government right you know because we are you know I'm talking biggest democracy on the planet you know it's, it's hard balancing all the equities and making sure that you know you, you provide that freedom of speech whilst also as far as you can mitigating the risk of you know awesome platforms being misused for the wrong purpose so so you know it's a very long-winded of saying um, yes we have some policy approaches but you know our big concern and certainly through the position that I hold is that international peace and seeing that there are actors whether they be attached to a state or non-state actors who are misusing it and we need to do more to ensure that their operating space is limited. Thank you, Ambassador. Go, Raman. Uh, Ambassador, uh, Dr. Fakin, this is Raman Sapori. I am the president of Aerospace Defense Consultants Association of India. My question to you is the experience of Australian cyber experts in uh, the unleashing of the threat to the cyber cities. India is working on 100 smart city projects. And uh, we're looking for some expert advice from your experience in Australia and the sanitization of the hardware and software because the critical infrastructure of utilities and many things are under threat. Earlier, the entire tendering process was anybody anywhere from the world could participate. Mm -hmm. But during the last two months after the COVID, the Indian government has put a stop to the use of hardware from China and software too. What are the best practices you could recommend to the Indian you know, OEMs and tier ones when they are integrating the smart city projects in India? It's a big area of collaboration between Australia and India. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you. 
Um, uh, look, that's a that's a fantastic question, um, and um, I couldn't hope to do justice to the entirety of that question. But I, I agree, you know, collaboration on this is vital. And smart cities, um, we see so many cities moving towards an IoT enabled environment, um, and IoT security is still something that I think collectively we haven't solved. The, the problem of IoT security. Um, that there's an anecdote that I sometimes tell, which is from my quite a long time ago now, uh, doing an interview with a, a cyber expert back in 2006, seven. Um, and I remember asking this guy, um, I'll leave him nameless for now, but needless to say, his credentials were solid. And I said, well, what's, what's your greatest concern? What's the greatest risk that you think you can see it as it stands and he said oh well it's definitely when i look into the iot environment um, and when i look at the kind of smart grid technologies that are being put out uh, and, and you know unveiled um, and he said i can do all sorts of damage through those now of course we can have an endless list of risks and you know vulnerabilities but um, interestingly i remember then over 10 years later in 2018 um, visiting an iot test range at a very reputable university um, and some awesome technical geniuses were setting up uh, the IoT devices. I was quite, it was, it was quite pleased to see that these were physical devices so I could actually see them and you know, <laughs> get a sense of where they might be positioned in the physical infrastructure. Um, and I said to the guys, I asked them the same question. I said, oh, this is really interesting. So where do you think the biggest threat lies in this IoT landscape? And the answer came out exactly the same. In, in smart grid technology. Now, smart grids are integral to everything we want to be in the future, but we're not solving the IoT issue because it's a supply chain issue and trying to, and I think that brings us neatly into the standards conversation. Do we, at the international level, start trying to drive international standards on IoT devices? I mean, I, I know all governments are asking themselves this question. We ourselves here came out with a fantastic piece of work from our Home Affairs Department around IoT voluntary standards for industry to provide them with, if you like, benchmark standards of where we feel they should be. Um, and it wasn't, uh, you know, enforced through legislation, but I mean, I'd happily share that with um, anyone who, who is interested in having a look at those. I think they're really good. Um, you know, partnership approach to what voluntary standards look like in IoT security. But I guess the most obvious um, area of enablement of smart cities is going to be through 5G. Um, and in that sense, I think that the, you know, 5G for us was um, a really useful process to go through as government um, in terms of if risk assessment of new technologies in understanding the you know the core value of what they were going what that particular technology was going to provide you know for us it's an integral and probably one of the most important infrastructure decisions we'd ever make as a nation was around 5g and therefore it was important that uh, if you like a risk assessment process was put over the top of that decision in, in terms of understanding the supply chain of where the technology is provided from, what some of the policy overlay would mean, um, and not just from a domestic point of view, but from a, a country of origin point of view, what that would mean for um, the, the, uh, the, the technology solution that we'd eventually buy. Um, and then, you know, understanding what kind of cybersecurity risk profile you'd be carrying once a mature 5G network was um, put into play. Um, and, you know, for most people, once they see 5G on their phone, it will mean just that it will be everything will be a bit quicker. But when you see the entire evolution of a 5G network, it is the absolute underpinnings of what everyone thinks in, you know, imagines smart cities to look like driverless cars, you know, kind of all sorts of advertising. My God, if we think we get advertised to right now, just wait until you're in a fully equipped smart city. Um, so for us, it was going through a very detailed process of, of risk, if you like, risk, risk management at every stage of that process. And if you can make decisions now, which safeguard you in the future, well, then why wouldn't you make them? So I think, you know, if there's, a, again, a, a very long-winded way of saying probably the simple answer would be 
to very close risk management of every part of your decision. Understanding supply chains, the technology, the policy, and if you, the cybersecurity risks of, of what you're introducing. And don't, and, and again, I mean, don't let that stop what we should all be doing, which is enjoying what smart cities will offer us. Because there's no doubting that, you know, the, the, we shouldn't allow the risks to outweigh the incredible benefits that all these kinds of enablements will allow us. Dr. Fagan, just to on that, on that, just, just your title change from cyber affairs mm. to now cyber affairs and critical technology. What what does critical technology entail? Is it just a, a, a slight variation of your title, knowing that cyber has such a broad gambit, mm. or does does critical sure. technology sort of affairs touch into this area as well? Um, I think what you rightfully point out is it, it's it's a maturation of the role it's an appreciation of the fact that um, I mean in a very practical sense uh, most conversations that I would have about anything to do with cyber affairs would invariably seem to develop into a conversation about another particular new and emerging or critical technology whether it I mean 5g probably being the, yeah. the first point of entry on that but then you'd quickly get into a conversation around AI, quantum computing, et cetera, et cetera. And often they would be very much related to the digital environment or the data which is produced by the digital environment. Um, and, and then you saw that being embodied in the international arena. So, you know, it, it's very logical that a position like this would widen so that it, if it takes, scoops up a bit more of that broader critical tech engagement. And that also puts increased emphasis on the kind of engagement that a position like this has to do and rightfully does um, with tech industry, um, all the way from SMEs up to multinational companies. You know, and we all know that big tech industry now has, you know, a lot of power at its disposal, whether it you know intends to or not, it does, from its data holdings to just the influence um, that it has. Therefore, your diplomatic engagement can't afford just to be with governments. Um, it needs to be more broader with that because, you know, we just as governments don't hold all the keys to the car, right? Um, yeah. There are there are a lot of others who have uh, a lot more parts in the equation. So it, it, it's a very natural evolution, um, one that's not without its complexities, but I think it's representative of um, any modern government now. Um, and, you know, my counterparts in, in India as well are seeing a very similar way of looking at the world through that broader tech lens as well. I suppose just from an, the audience perspective, there's a couple of questions here from the audience that we can refer to in closing. But I suppose my, my view from the Australian perspective and when we talk to partners like India and the massive market that that represents and the, the shift to the Indo-Pacific strategy how does your role and uh, tap into everything else? Because obviously Australia is reaching out to the Pacific. We had you mm -hmm. with uh, Israel and have those types of relationships mm -hmm. as well. And very, very much uh, very busy in the ASEAN region too, and particularly recently with Indonesia. Yep. Do we have the resources there to be reaching out with partners? And India is a massive market. Uh, I suppose maybe what, what's the sort of sit rep status of where we are with India yep. and I suppose the outlook that we would anticipate over the next sort of next two to three years. Mm. Um, well I mean it would be uh, remiss of me sitting in a, a, a Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade if I didn't reach out as widely as I possibly could through a position like this. Um, you know tech, tech affects us all therefore it's a prerequisite of the job. Um, in in terms of India I think you know, it's it's everything that you're seeing come out very publicly through our leaders um, is that, yes, we, we should be doing more together and we are. Um, and so I think, you know, having an announcement through the comprehensive strategic partnership as we have is um, an excellent step up in everything that we do with India. Um, and I think, you know, on, on a from a tech perspective, it just made so much sense at every level. And I know our, our, our prime ministers were, uh, our, our leadership were incredibly keen on this area of collaboration. Um, 
and so I think you can only expect that that will flourish in in the coming years. So I think it's 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 often about finding good projects to work on, um, particular technology areas, policy issues, and if we can make some of those work well, um, then the sky's the limit, really. Um, and you know, I'm I'm excited. I'm always excited about coming to India and visiting and and spending wonderful, you know, uh, real real affinity for India. Um, but I'm really excited about finding those partnerships and assisting others in finding those partnerships and maturing our relationship ever further. You know, and and putting money where our mouth is is one way of backing that and showing that, you know, to be crass it's got legs on it <laughs> um so you know i'm looking forward to that collaborative piece of of working out you know exactly which projects we're going to take forward so um you know our high commission in delhi is very much plugged into this and please reach out to them as well um and you know we're, we're excited about the partnerships that we can create as it happens next week we have startup india and all cyber along with uh, the New South Wales Trade Commissioner on. So uh, that's, that's one way, one area that we're looking to start on, at least the, the startups uh, mm -hmm. and those opportunities. There's one question here uh, you touched on. Um, there's a question here. How can we tap, uh, tap into the 2 million of the e-partnership funds to initiate a cybersecurity set, centre of excellence in one of the new IITs? Raman, maybe if you could just introduce the IIT uh, aspect but i suppose before uh, before i hand over to dr Feekin, is there any any key parts other than the the, uh, the high commission that the audience might take interest in and look at look at in terms of the the key strategies to look at and i notice one thing i did have is we have a an india economic strategy to 2035 that's something that australia has been looking at for some time but what's a key takeaway, I suppose, from the audience perspective on where to start, given the size of this? You want me to answer that question, Chris? Sorry, Raman, have I lost you? Yeah, no. Uh, so, no, I was Chris, actually, I referred back to the amb yeah, ambassador yeah, in terms of the key takeaways. Uh, the Indian government is now investing in Startup India. As you know, Bangalore and a couple of other cities India is becoming the new in startup capital for India. And uh, Indian Institute of Technology is now setting up incubation centers. And many of these students of today are becoming business freaks of tomorrow. I myself have been investing my time in advising students. And we start at 9 o'clock in the morning. By evening, 5 p.m., the company is created. And this is something which could have never been happening earlier. So any student having any idea six of them get together they start a company and they get the money and uh, it helps business partners from across the world because what had happened in the silicon valley is happening in india also today in many many areas itself and uh, last week we had interaction with indian institute of technology where we are going to work with one of your premium universities to work on the cyber university campus while the academia to academia partnership will happen, we are also trying to see which framework of the industry can work together. Over here, we have got AVM Sina from Bharat Electronics, a big public sector undertaking. But we also have other, uh, you know, small and medium enterprise. And it will help creating jobs at both the sides of the spectrum. And the government of India is investing money in these incubation centers. So academia, industry, and uh, the big players from Australia and India could find a partnership. So my suggestion to the ambassador and Mr. Chris would be that while this webinar series is over, we should have a separate uh, channel of discussion going on to generate business for both the countries and both the things itself. So we have got investors available Thank you, and uh, they want to do that. Yeah, over to Chris. Thank you, Raman. And I, I must apologize, just uh, noted the time as well. We uh, we had the ambassador for a firm hour, and obviously we mentioned the strategic partnerships he has to reach out to. So he is uh, extremely busy. Um, with that, we'll, we'll follow up with uh, the ambassador's office in terms of some key takeaways for this. And then we'll also maintain contact with the ambassador's office uh, 
uh, particularly for the government government relations and the industry relations that we're observing uh, as we go through this series. Dr. Feekin, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, maybe just a closing comment and, and a parting parting comment, and uh, we'll let you let you move on. Sure, absolutely, and I'm sorry for the hard stop no, no. of five uh, for my time anyway. Um, but no, I mean I couldn't have. The, 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 what you just said just then was exactly how I'd have responded. You know, just keep in touch with me and the team um, because, you know, we, we're designing a lot of this now. So, you know, just important that we co-design, keep in touch. Um, and look, let's, let's, find out where, let's find out where the opportunities are and drive them home. I'm, you know, let's, let's capitalize on the level of interest we have from our leadership and, and drive forward. So I, I mean, I just want to thank again the opportunity. You know, Chris, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, Air Vice Marshal, thanks so much for um, apologies that I wasn't on the first part of the call. Um, and Raman, thank you as well for all of your insights. Um, and looking forward to speaking to you both more in the in the coming months ahead. Um, and really looking forward to um, being in India when I can. Um, please, everyone, stay safe. These are. Um, particularly strange times for all of us, um, but there's no doubting that we are seeing technology play a central role in keeping us sane, connected and flourishing. So uh, let's keep that in mind always. So thank you very much, everyone, um, and look forward to speaking to you more in the future. Thanks very much, Dr. Speaker. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. We'll let you go. Um, look, um, uh, hopefully that represents uh, you know, something in Australia here, it's uh, it's very proud to be able to reach out to someone of Toby's uh, status and, and he give us that time as well, given the role and responsibility that he has. Last week, we had uh, two distinguished panelists from IIT Jammu and from Australia, Mr. John Selby, discussing what India and Australia can do together and what we have planned to do is move ahead for signing a protocol between the in Indian Academia and the Australian Academia and the Indian industry. Now, people are asking me, where is the money in cybersecurity? Well, it's a software and hardware business itself. In this panel, we have got a lot of experts available. So should you be having any small piece of the cake in your company's portfolio, this is the best time to get into cybersecurity. And the Australian government has invested or planning to invest 1.5 billion US dollar, 1.5 billion US dollar. And the Indian government also, as you must have seen, have banned 59 application which were used by Chinese applications. So I know for sure the early birds will catch the best cake available. So in case you have any doubts, reach out to us or to my team in Delhi or Bangalore. Uh, our association is available in 20 cities in India and outside India also. So with Chris, what we are seeing is that we will continue this discussion on a every Tuesday webinar series for one hour and we will close it on 15th August, India's Independence Day, when some of the panelists will be rewarded and uh, gifted with their uh, protective prices itself. If you have any question in the meanwhile, you can please write it down and then we'll be able to answer you during the session or after the session. You could leave your email IDs behind or contact address also. As you must have seen, Bharat Electronics is working on many big projects in India and now the government of India has come out with Defense Procurement Procedure 2020. And with the Make in India and made in India policy, the global majors from Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and many other uh, industry leaders from all over India are wanting to look for partnerships. Just for the sake of uh, our panelists, Lockheed Martin is starting a month-long uh, India search supplier conference starting on 27th of July for a month. And this is going to be both for the global, global supply chain as well as for the offset programs. So in case you want any assistance, what is Lockheed Martin doing for it? So they've got four areas. One is, of course, the space. Second is, of course, the aeronautics. 
then the missile defense and rotary missile defense itself. So four areas starting on 27th. So, so request you to kindly uh, leave your contact behind so that we can ensure that you are part of the global supply chain. And this is the best time because what people say that COVID is disturbed the business, but COVID also has given many new ideas for business itself. So uh, over to AVM Sina, if you'd like to add some points here. Nani Raman sir, it's uh, really uh, this is the godsend opportunity <clears throat> that uh, it's the time that we uh, be atmanirbhar, uh, self-dependent. The indigenization is the need of the hour, and uh, uh, you must be aware that on 5th July, under the aegis of Sri Sri uh, Ravi Shankar Ji, uh, and uh, the app was launched named Element, which has got, uh, which had all the three, four uh, facilities like WhatsApp facility, uh, the video conferencing, it had uh, something like Twitter and you could do the shopping also. So a very good uh, app has been launched. Uh, now India is uh, coming up uh, and with the supply chain uh, disruption because of China basically, uh, there is now need felt in all the industry uh, and as you rightly said cyber security is the uh, main thing which people those who are uh, the viewers who are uh, listening and those who can enter into this foray it is a, going to be a big business because see what has happened is today the industry is also realizing that they have to uh, depend on cyber security because people are working from different places distributed places and because of that, now the multi-factor authentication has come into uh, play. That is very, very important. Also important is your, <clears throat> uh, there is new policy which is coming up that is called zero trust approach. You can't trust anybody in this world today because of various reasons. So authentication at various levels, the hierarchy model, and the industry has to work on this model and there are companies uh, which are giving solutions to this new firewall has, is being thought of next gen firewall is the thing and so there are many applications and once the companies are realizing that they have to uh, go on the virtual private network vpn also they have to shift their all the data not at uh, one place they have to shift it on the cloud and once they migrate to cloud then the cloud vulnerability also comes into play. So it's a it's a uh, amazing world which is opening up, and with the coming in IOTs, which is uh, again manipulative to the cyber threat, a lot of challenges are there. And this is the time all the software engineers, the hardware engineers, can put in brain and can devise the uh, thing. And uh, as earlier in the starting, we all saw uh, Chris has showed. Uh, the China, you must be aware that 50,000 and more, uh, more than 50,000, about a lakh plus people are employed by this country, especially for cyber threat. And uh, Australia, I believe, was uh, had uh, the cyber attack uh, recently. Uh, I think Chris and other people can throw lights more on that. So this is a threat, threat emanating from the adversary country, threat emanating from uh, radical organization threat emanating from hackers. So this is a new change of order, and people people should come up and people should give solution. This is the right time, as Raman Sab said, and he is in the um, business where he can connect the academia, connect the industry, connect MSME, and connect. And this is a fantastic uh, platform, Raman Sab. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sina sir. Just for the sake of audience, uh, our association also uh, arranges investments. And uh, in case any one of you has got an idea, whether it's startup or a mid-segment company, uh, we are in dialogue with one of the big groups uh, from Austria to set up a big plant in Mysore for setting up the electronic PCBs, the okay. thing which were initially imported by India. Uh, the project is already vetted by the Ministry of Electronics 
and uh, government of India and also by Invest India also. So something like 60 crore worth of investment is coming up. That is one. Secondly, we are wanting to set up a cyber university in India. So we're looking for a partnership model and mm -hmm. uh, we will not only have the uh, academic, uh, you know, lead role played by IIT Jammu. We also look for industry partners itself. And this is something which is not in the drawing board. It is a reality itself. The other issue is that uh, we are now, uh, you know, in touch with a big group in uh, USA who want to invest in India in the defense corridor itself. So any one of you in whichever part of the segment, whether hardware, software, whether mechanical, special materials. So it is requested to reach out to the association for connecting it. In today's time when we can't physically meet, best thing is to collaborate. And if we don't collaborate, somebody else next to you will take over the business. So what we are realizing the last three months is that. So the more you collaborate, the more business you get, you get more business and you want to reduce the cost itself. So what we are saying is that people from all different countries in the last two months, I have seen connection from Switzerland, from Israel, from Sweden, from Spain, from USA, from Canada. A lot of people reaching out and India is the next uh, nerve center for business. India has the budget and uh, Indian uh, government is very positive. The speed and ease of business is very good. And uh, no matter what the COVID says, you can't depend on government and God to run your business. So any crazy idea which you have got, whether it's on the electric vehicle or anything else, we need technology. We are willing to do that. India offers the advantage of time. And our two next episodes, which are going to be very, very interesting for the industry. One is on the 3D printing. 3D printing, we are working both on the defense and non-defense. On the non-defense, we'll have experts from the medical fraternity as from the um, uh, you know manufacturing sector itself auto sector and uh, the other big thing is the mro maintenance repair overall we will be covering both the civil aerospace as well as the military aerospace itself as you know the indian government in the mro has reduced the gst from 18 percent to five percent that's a very uh, this happened just before the covid so after that, the airline industry went for a toss because of COVID. But India has the advantage of time zones. And uh, India has got a lot of, you know, aircrafts on order, both Boeing, Airbus and other things also. So uh, the LRUs which were going from India to Singapore or Dubai or to even USA can now be repaired in India itself, both for military. And uh, just for the sake of audience, both Indian outside, Indian government has now come out with the expression of interest for consultancy to privatize or commercialize the Ordnance Factory Board. Chris, you are there. Over to you. Take over. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, but look, I think to move on and, and given the, the delay that we had, I think we'll close this particular session. Hopefully it gives us more to contemplate into the future. But it's an excellent. Maybe AVM Sina would like to say the closing remarks. AVM Sina. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks uh, Raman sir. Uh, this was a great uh, session. And yes, as you said, uh, academia, industry, and uh, uh, big uh, uh, <clears throat> partners should come together. This is the time when we can connect and reconnect and can take the country forward. This is a time when we can grow indigenous solution in this country. We have got wherewithal. Only thing is uh, bad guidance, uh, bad uh, investment. And yes, you all are giving, you, you all are doing a very human service, connecting India and Australia. And that's a great. And thanks, Chris. And thanks, Raman sir. It was a pleasure to be on this show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marshall. We appreciate your time. Um, and on, on that, we will just close off with a couple of closing slides and keep you up to date in terms of what we're doing over the next week or two. Uh, Dr. Feakin was an excellent lead into next week with Piranha Mehta, the Chief of Ecosystem Development at Cyber, and Shivanji Jain, the Head of Cooperation and Partnerships at Startup India. And we're going to be uh, joined by the New South Wales Trade Commissioner, 
Mr. Chachandra. Uh, so very, very special panel next week as well, where we can really talk about the sort of the, le the level of startups and also those key partnerships uh, out of that. And with uh, Rohit there as the New South Wales Trade Commissioner, he's, he's on the ground in Delhi, uh, so that he provides that state government link into the uh, Indian aspect of the economy too. And I had the pleasure of being in India with, uh, with, with Rohit last year uh, with the New South Wales government. So looking forward to that one, uh, at same time next Tuesday. We covered off on episode three. Thank you, Raman, for walking us through that. That video is available on the YouTube channel and the playlist. Um, I'll briefly touch on the marketplace, some recent threat reports, some fo Australia-focused threat reports, both out of VMware, and I touched on the Cyber Australia's Digital Trust Report, well, well worth a flick through. And uh, Air Vice Marshal, you touched on the social media aspect of what Australia is doing. This particular report from the eSafety uh, Office, eSafety Commission, I looked at COVID and the impact on Australian adults' online activities and attitudes, and it touches on the social media aspect of that also, uh, and some other white papers that have recently come out, uh, particularly on some APTs, uh, and that's come from Bitdefender, it's worth a look. Um, I suppose one other cybersecurity aspect to look out for that we've just announced today is a webinar on the 27th of July with the New South Wales Government, Oz Cyber and Standards Australia. So this is an industry and government and uh, sort of the, the, the connections between that and the standards for cybersecurity in Australia, bringing a range of different industry groups together, talking to government, talking to the likes of Oz Cyber with the startup, startup ecosystem, and working out what those key areas are for resiliency in the um, in capacity building for cybersecurity. So we'll keep up to date on that one. And that also has Piranha Meta from the uh, Ossiber also. So we'll be hearing from her next week uh, and we'll touch on that. Ramon, just a quick reminder on your 3D printing sessions, we've yet to add that to our channel. So if you can send me through uh, your contact email for that, we'll get that listed on the marketplace, but just giving it a plug coming up in August, September, October and November around uh, India. Uh, we do have a Slack channel. If anyone wants to get going on Slack, we're introducing a forum to this session as well. But uh, in the interims, we'll use Slack to share files uh, uh, remotely, but otherwise a forum should be up and running next week. Uh, and on our channels, there is an opportunity for a free book if you're interested on identity attack vectors. Follow our links through on My Security Marketplace and that banner is there. Uh, and uh, the Beyond Trust team will sort that out. This was a recorded session, uh, video and audio with the ambassador. Uh, we will have this on our YouTube channel over the next sort of 24, 48 hours. Uh, if you want to keep up for the series or register for the series, you simply go to mysecuritymarketplace.com India webinar series and uh, you'll be able to log in and see all the previous videos and also see what's coming up uh, soon. Otherwise, Raman will keep in touch with you. So on that note, uh, thank you so much again, Raman. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Air Vice Marshal, for your time. And thank we also you. thank Dr. Toby Beacon, the Australian Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.